<laughs> um, you know what I like, though? God uses small things. Small, insignificant things to accomplish big things. Scripture is full of stories like that. I'm going to share a story with you this morning that you know very well, but there are certain things in this story that you've, that you've overlooked that are incredibly powerful. Um, you know, the irony of these small things is that generally, miracles in your life are seeded with those small things. Those small things, those little nuances, those little situations, those, those small trials are actually seeds for the next miracle in your, your life. You know, Pastor, uh, Pastor Hector, he would be upset if I called him that. <laughs> Prophet Hector last week talked about open doors. He said that this is a season of open doors. That has just been ruminating me in me all week as I've been preparing this message because I think that if we don't begin to pay attention to those small things, we won't be able to open the door. Do you realize that, that God does provide doors, but you have to open those doors? Do you actually have to will to walk through them? And I think that if we don't find the keys to get through those doors, we will miss opportunities. And I think a lot of those opportunities are actually seeded in stuff that we just don't pay attention to. And uh, as I was looking at this, I see this basket every time I leave the house, honey, just so you know. And I put more stuff in it. Eventually, I'm going to have to get a bigger basket, or I'm going to, or Charlotte's going to put it in my office. Actually, that's what she's been doing lately. Every time I go in my office, there's like, more stuff in there. So she's, she's moving all my little baskets and things in my office in hopes that eventually I'll organize it or do something with it. So I will, honey. I plan on it. I'm working on it. <clears throat> um, I was reading, reading this, this book called David and Goliath. It was actually uh, written by somebody, at least at the time, in, in the process of writing this book, he actually came back to his faith. Um, he, was a, he was a Mennonite, but he's a writer. He's written for, I think, New York Times. And, um, but, but the book, because it had my name on it, you know, I was drawn to it. And it was about the late David and Goliath, and the story's always fascinated me. It's, it's just a great, a great story, you know, kind of about an, an, an underdog or somebody small tackling someone, someone big. So it's an interesting story, and I figured, well, it's in the bookstore in the, in the airport. I was on one of those four-hour layovers, one of those layovers that you're thinking, if I get in a car, I'm going to be able to get to my destination faster which was the case, you know, but I had time to kill, so I picked up this book, and I was reading this book, and I saw some things about the story of David and Goliath that no, no one ever shared with me, and it's fascinating, and it applies to the message that I believe the Lord has for you this morning, for all of us, as we're in this new season of, of open doors, because to go through those doors, we're going to have to discover those seeds that God has already planted in your hand. Can, can, you, can you do something for me? Can you sit say? What is in my hand? Hold up your hand and ask that question. What is in my hand? Ask, ask the Lord that as, as I share the message with you this morning. In that book, there was a story about a suspension bridge. Uh, most of you have no idea that this bridge exists because it doesn't exist anymore. There was a bridge over the Niagara Falls Gorge. That was a suspension bridge, and I think it's replaced now, and I don't even think it's in use. It's, it's replaced with a steel arch bridge. Is it still closed? Okay, it's a Lewiston bridge, so the bridge is, the bridge is gone. It was, a cable, it was a cable bridge at first, and then it was a, it replaced by a steel bridge, and this cable bridge actually transported locomotives and trains, and it was the first suspension bridge in the United, United States of America. So... Uh, if, if you're interested in history or interested in bridges and engineering, read about the story. It's a cool story. But, but what most people don't know about that story is how the bridge was constructed, the first step in construction. They actually had this contest, and they had a bunch of young men try to fly kites across the gorge. And... Most of them failed, but there was one particular young man, I, I think as I put his name in here, here Homan, Homan Walsh flew a kite across the gorge, and, and he tied a string to a tree. And what they did with this string 
is they tie another stronger string to the kite and pulled it across. Then a stronger one pulled it across. Then a rope pulled it across. A stronger rope pulled it across. And it eventually, they pulled a seven-inch steel cable across the bridge to build a suspension bridge. That seven-eighths-inch steel cable supported a carriage that, that they would transport workmen out to begin to construct the suspension bridge. But all started with a kite. You imagine that? I'll start with a kite. There's a lot of stories like that, battles that are won, um, victories that are, that are accomplished, you know, businesses that are started from, like, the strangest idea or by an unlikely individual. Scripture is actually full of stories like that. Why? Because those stories are unusual or they're anomalies, or is it because that's often how life is? It's interesting, some of the most successful people that you read about did not live a lifestyle of success. They were not born into success. They had, had adversity. They had disabilities. They had all sorts of things in their way, but there was something in that as they faced that, that giant that, that enabled them to accomplish great things. And in the story about David, David Goliath is one of, one of those stories. It's typically told... As, as a story about an underdog. But I'm going to show you that David really wasn't an underdog at all in that story. <clears throat> the message this morning is about how ordinary people like you and me confront the giants in our lives. I mean, most, most of us are never going to have to fight uh, a physical being that's, there's some argument as to how tall Goliath was, but between 7 to 10 feet tall, most of us will never ever have to take out a giant like that. But all of us have giants in our lives, stuff that we have to overcome, walls that we have to climb over. And if we're not willing to do that, if we're not willing to face those, those giants, those obstacles, that, then we'll never be able to move ahead in this season. We'll never be able to go through those open doors. And God desires us to accomplish those things. I want to show you a couple things that there are valuable lessons to be learned from lopsided conflicts. David and Goliath would be considered a lopsided conflict. Even the people that lived during that time saw it as a lopsided conflict. They, they, they sent David out there to his doom. They were assuming that he was going to be killed. They had no hope for him at all. Also, we misread these conflicts. Like, I've misread this story so many times. And that giants are often not what we think they are. We think that they're these big, ominous, looming things, but if you really dig down, particularly find the courage that God can put in you through the power of the Holy Spirit, these giants really are not that big. I mean, think about some of the things in your past that have kept you from succeeding. Think about them. You know, maybe they were a learning disability, but you found a way around it. You found different study habits. You know, you can never pass tests, but then somebody showed you how to study for them properly or differently. And all of a sudden, you're, you're getting good grades in school. I mean, many of us have stories like that. Well, this story is kind of like that. But we've, what we've discovered in our stories is that, that those big giants really aren't so big. They're not so strong. So if you could turn to 1 Samuel 17, I'm going to read a lot of this story, and I'm going to ask you, have a new mind and new eyes as I read through the story this morning. I'm going to skip around a bit. Um, I'm going to skip the first couple of verses and I think start at verse 3. But this is actually from the message version. <clears throat> so the Philistines were on one hill, the Israelites on the opposing hill, with the valley between them. A giant nearly 10 feet tall, at least this version says that, stepped out from the Philistine line into the open, Goliath from Gath. He had a bronze helmet on his head and was dressed in armor. They think there was, that armor weighed about 126 pounds. He wore bronze shin, shin guards and carried a bronze sword. His spear was like a fence rail. The spear tip alone weighed over 15 pounds. His shield bearer walked ahead of him. Goliath stood there and called out to the Israelite troops, why bother using your whole army? Am I not Philistine enough for you? And you're all committed to Saul, aren't you? 
So pick your best fighter and pit him against me. If he gets the upper hand and kills me, the Philistines will all become your slaves. But if I get the upper hand and kill him, you'll all become our slaves and serve us. I challenge the troops of Israel this day, give me a man, let us fight it out together. When Saul and his troops heard the Philistines' challenge, they were terrified and lost hope. Enter David into the picture. He was the son of Jeff Jesse from Bethlehem in Judah. Jesse, the father of eight sons, was himself too old to join Saul's army. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to war. That's why David was there. He was there to bring them lunch. The names of the three sons who had joined up with Saul were Elib, the firstborn, next, Eben, Eben oh man, I'm, these Hebrew names, Ebenadab, and third, Shema. David was the youngest son. While his three oldest brothers went to war with Saul, David went back and forth from attending to Saul to tending his father's sheep in Bethlehem. David was a shepherd boy. Each morning and evening for 40 days, Goliath took his stand and made his speech. One day, Jesse told David, his son, take this sack of cracked wheat and these 10 loaves of bread and run them down to your brothers in the camp and take these 10 wedges of cheese to the captain of their division. Check in on your brothers to see whether they are getting along all right and let me know how they're doing. Saul and your brothers and all the Israelites in their, their war with the Philistines are in the war with the Philistines in the Oak Valley. David was up at the crack of dawn, having arranged for someone to tend his flock. He took the food and was on his way just as Jesse had directed him. He arrived at the camp just as the army was moving into battle formation, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines moved into position facing each other, battle ready. David left his bundles of food in the care of a sentry, ran to the troops who were deployed, and greeted his brothers. While they were talking together, the Philistine champion, Goliath of Gath, Gath, stepped out from the front lines of the Philistines and gave his usual challenge, and David heard him. The Israelites, to a man, fell back the moment they saw the giant, totally frightened. The talk among the troops was, have you ever seen anything like this? This man openly and defiantly challenges Israel. The man who kills the giant will have it made. The king will give him a huge reward, offer his daughter as a bride, and give his entire family a free ride. Even if this was, this was made available to me, I still don't think I'd go out and fight Goliath. David, who was walking or talking to the men standing around him, asked, What's in it for the man who kills that Philistine and gets rid of this ugly blot on Israel's honor? Who does he think he is anyways, this uncircumcised Philistine taunting the armies of God alive? They told him what everyone was saying about, that, about the king would do for the man who killed the Philistine. Elab, his older brother, heard David fraternizing with the men and lost his temper. What are you doing here? This is you know, typical of an older brother. Why aren't you minding your own business, tending that scrawny flock of sheep? I know what you're up to. You've come down here to see the sights, hoping for a ringside seat of a bloody battle. What is it with you, replied David. All I did was ask a question. Ignoring his brother, he turned to someone else, asked the same question, and got the same answer as before. The things David was saying were picked up and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. Master, said David, don't give up hope. I'm ready to go and fight this Philistine. I mean, if you could picture this. Um, when Samuel went to anoint the future king, David was left in the field, right? Remember? All, all the tall, handsome brothers were there, but David was left in the field. Jesse didn't even think to get David. He was insignificant in his mind and certainly was not a picture of a king. I know there's lots of pictures and descriptions of David, but back, back then, at least at this point, he was probably some scrawny, skinny, skinny kid. And here you have this scrawny, skinny kid on the battlefield saying, I'll take this guy out. <clears throat> Saul must have been desperate. Saul answered David, you can't go and fight this Philistine. You're too young and inexperienced. And he's been at this fighting business since before you were born. David said, I've been a shepherd tending sheep for my father. 
Whenever a lion or bear came and took the lamb from the flock, I'd go after it, knock it down, and rescue the lamb. If it turned on me, I'd grab it by the throat, wring its neck, and kill it. Lion or bear, it made no difference. I killed it. And I'll do the same to this Philistine pig who was haunting the troops of God alive. God who delivered me from the teeth of the lion and the claws of the bear will deliver me from this Philistine. Saul said, go and God help you. (laughs) I don't know if that was an encouragement or not. Then Saul outfitted David as a soldier in armor. He put on his bronze helmet on his head and belted his sword over the armor. David tried to walk, but he couldn't hardly budge because it was too much weight. David told Saul, I can't even move with all this stuff on me. I'm not used to this, and he took it all off. Then David took a shepherd's staff, selected five smooth stones from the brook, and put them in the pocket of the shepherd's pack, and with his sling in his hand approached Goliath. As the Philistine paced back and forth, his shield bearer in front of him, he noticed David. He took one look on him and and sneered, a mere youngster, apple-cheeked and peach-buzzed. The Philistine ridiculed David. Am I a dog that you come after me with sticks? Some versions say stick. Other versions say sticks. This is interesting. I'm going to bring this out in a minute. And he cursed him by, by his gods. Come on, said the Philistine. I'll make roadkill for the buzzards. I'll turn you into a tasty morsel for the field mice. David answered, you come at me with a sword and spear and a battle axe. I come at you with the name of the god of the angel armies, the God of Israel's troops, whom you curse and mock. This very day, God is handing you over to me. I'm about to kill you, cut off your head, and serve your body and the bodies of your Philistine buddies to the crows and the coyotes. The whole earth will know that there's an extraordinary God in Israel. And everyone gathered here will learn that God doesn't save by means of sword or spear. The battle belongs to God, He's handing you to us on a platter. That roused the Philistine, and he started towards David. David took off from the front line, running towards the Philistine. David reached into his pocket for a stone and slung it and hit the Philistine hard in the forehead, embedding the stone deeply. The Philistine crashed face down in the dirt. That's how David beat the Philistine, with a sling and a stone. He hit him and killed him. No sword for David. Then David ran up to the Philistine and stood over him, pulled the giant's sword from its sheath, and finished the job by cutting off his head. When the Philistines saw their great champion was dead, they scattered, running for their lives. The men of Israel and Judah were on their feet, shouting. Yeah, now they were. They chased the Philistines all the way to the outskirts of Gath in the gates of Ekron. All of a sudden, they have courage. Wounded Philistines were strewn along the Sharum road all the way to Gath in Ekron. And then you could read the rest of the story. Now, Goliath, I don't think he was expecting to be fought the way that he was fought. If you pay attention to the way Goliath was dressed, he had all this heavy armor. He was a big guy, and I'm sure he was strong, but I don't think he'd be running around like David who didn't have any armor on him. He had all this heavy armor and all, these, all this weaponry that was like close-range combat weaponry. Not David. He didn't even have a sword. He had a sling, and he had a stone. You know, back in ancient times, it's very similar to, to even these times, but back in ancient times, there was three types of warriors. There was the cavalry. They were the warriors that rode on horses, and they often had swords and shields, sometimes javelins. There were infantrymen, which was Goliath. They were like the foot soldiers. They had all the armor. It was close combat fighting. And then there were projectile warriors. That's what they called them back then. They would be like the artillery now. They're the folks with the guns, the long rifles. This is, this is what David was. David was fighting Goliath on different terms. Goliath was what, wasn't expecting that because he was full of pride. He was confident in, in who he was. And he was expecting that the Israelites would send someone down just like him in armor, and he would probably overcome him and be victorious. But David didn't fight that way. Now, you could say that God set this up like that, 
and I, God was certainly involved in this. But David, even if he was given a sword, and he was given a sword, he was given armor. It was too big for him. It was too heavy. There's no way that he could have fought that way. He fought with the way, the, the way that, he, or, or, or the weapon that he used to defend the sheep because he was a shepherd. In the most effective way to take down a lion or a bear, do you think that David ran up to that lion before he hit him with something and tackled him, got him in a chokehold and killed him? Uh Uh-uh. David used that that sling in the past to hurl that stone and incapacitate that bear or lion, and then he went up to them. Now, sure, God gives men supernatural strength, but I don't think that was the case with this lion and the bear. I don't think it was the case with Goliath either. He gave, them, he gave him courage, but it was David's skills as a slinger that defeated this giant. Now, Goliath was seven feet tall. He was a big target. David was a small target. I mean, it wouldn't be too hard to hit a big target. Now, a little more difficult to hit him in the head, to kill him, to avoid all the armor. I mean, he had a helmet on. I mean, so it was an incredible shot. And there are great marksmen out there, and David, David was certainly one of them. But, but Goliath is, is this, this big target. He was asking for, for like, single combat. And David was not going to fight on those terms. He wore heavy, heavy armor. He had heavy weapons. He's not going to run around like David. And what's interesting about this story, and historians have really dug into this, and biblical theologians have dug into this, try to figure out why Goliath would fight David on these terms and why David would fight him. And what's interesting in the story, there was a shield bearer. You remember the shield bearer? Why would Goliath need a shield bearer to carry his shield? Typically, shield bearers would go out with projectile warriors, like archers, because archers, they needed two hands to pull back the bow. So they would have a shield bearer run out there with them to protect the projectile warrior. Goliath wasn't one of them. Why did he need a shield bearer? This is fascinating. Medical experts now believe that Goliath suffered from a particular disease, a tumor on his pituitary gland that that caused him to be large. And what is common with this this ailment is that it causes vision problems. Remember, remember I I said in a a couple different versions, it, it says, you come at me with a stick, or you come at me with sticks, it's very possible, plausible, that Goliath might have even had double vision, which is common with this this issue. It's possible that the very thing that gave Goliath his size was also the source of his greatest weakness. David, he wanted David to fight, or Saul wanted David to fight like an infantryman. David was not going to fight that way. He was a shepherd boy. When you think about David's lowly beginnings, think about how much time a shepherd has in a field taking care of sheep. They got a lot of time to practice slinging stones. David, David, because of who he was, also spent a lot of time knowing his God. He had a unique love for God. I believe he had a unique unique ear to hear from the Lord. He He had... Unusual confidence in who his God was and what God can do and perform through him. He was considered the least of his brothers, but he didn't allow this to get in his head. I mean, here you got this little little kid who has probably been criticized by his brothers, called small by his brothers, called weak by his brothers, but he knew who, who he was. He took down lions and bears in the past. Why wouldn't God help him take down this Goliath? So this time of solitude, because he was a shepherd, gave him hours of quiet time to spend with the Lord, and he cultivated an ear to hear and an understanding of the strength and the faithfulness of his God. Because he was the least, and he had a menial job, it helped him develop two skills that were necessary to take down this giant. And also, subdue other giants in his future. One was he became an expert sling thrower, and then the other, he was a musician. What other giant did he take down because he was a musician? Saul called him into his presence. Remember what Saul dealt with? Demonic oppression and demons, and he would have David come in 
and play his instrument, and David would subdue another giant because of the skill that he learned out in the field. The sling, I was interested in this, and most hunters would be. The sling is a devastating weapon. Irish slingers were said to be able to hit a coin from as far as they can see. In judges, slingers could kill or seriously injure a target at distances up to 200 yards away. 200 yards is a football field. Could you imagine taking a pouch? What's that? Yes, right, two football fields. A strap, a pouch in between. I mean, they're not like the wrist rockets now. They were like a strap with a pouch between, slinging that stone at a speed of 150 miles an hour. You know, there were actually tools that they made back then to pry the stones out of, out of the bodies of people that got hit by these stones. It is equivalent of, of being in a battle with a guy with a 45 caliber pistol. So, you know, when you, when you read the story, you think, you know, at first, you would have been like Saul. David doesn't have a chance. But actually, David really had the unfair advantage. Goliath has all this heavy weaponry, all this heavy armor. He's not going to be running around. And here we got David, who's quite mobile, and an expert with a sling that can throw a stone at 150 miles an hour. And it clocked Goliath right in the forehead. Is it possible that it could become the very thing that brings success in your life? If you, if you notice what the giant is in your life and how to defeat it. You know, the giants in our lives, it's probably not going to be a Goliath, but it could be like financial lack. It could be some sort of disability. Could defeating that giant, discovering the keys to defeat that giant, be the very thing that creates success in your life? Could it be the very thing that causes you to walk through those doors that God is opening for you? You know, I wasn't very athletic. Growing up, you would never know that now. Incredibly athletic. I wasn't very athletic. I was a late boomer. When my, I've told this many times. When my wife first met me at 14 years old, she was taller than me. Um, she's not taller than me now. I like little things, you know, so I ended up marrying <laughs> my short wife. But back then, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't incredibly coordinated. I was, a, I was a late bloomer. But because of that, you know, I had to I had to pursue other interests, and because small things always interested me, and I've always wanted to discover how things worked. I was just always fascinated with that. You know, I would take things apart, even if I didn't know how to put it back together. I would still take them apart because I, I wanted to know how, how things ran, how things were, were built, how things were wired. It, so because I wasn't good at one thing, I discovered something that I was good at. And it actually created opportunities of success in my life. I'm not bragging. I'm, I'm proving a point. At 23 years, 23 years old, I built our first house. From the things that I've learned by paying attention. And I did work, I did work construction jobs. And obviously, I schooled, I schooled myself. But at 23 years old, I built my first house. And really, when I think back, of where I developed those skills, I developed those skills because I was not good at something else. I've been able to bless other people because of it. I actually helped build this sanctuary because of it. But again, when I think back, it all started because I wasn't good at a thing that I wanted to be good at, but never could. So I gained other interests. There are advantages and disadvantages. And there are disadvantages and advantages. You know, when you look at someone and you covet what they have or you covet their job, the, the money that they have, you don't know the price they paid to get there. And I can tell you, money, prominence, success, being born in a certain family is not necessarily an advantage. I mean, when you study most people who win the lottery, most of them end up in bankruptcy in 10 years. They end up back where they started. You know, you, you find a young man or a young wo woman that, that, that gains success early on in life and starts to make millions. There's lots of athletes and, 
who, who, have, who have done this, have achieved great things and made lots of money and ended up bankrupt. It doesn't bring them happiness, and they're on their fourth or their fifth or their sixth marriage. What we consider as an advantage is not necessarily an advantage. It actually can become a disadvantage, and a disadvantage can become an advantage if you have a different perspective. You know, that's what facing giants in our lives are like. We can look at it as this thing that we can never overcome. It's too big. Or we can say to ourselves, what is in my hand? Or God, what have you given me to help me overcome this thing so my weakness actually becomes my strength? Some of our greatest ministries, opportunities of personal ministry or opportunities in, in, in ministry or in, or in jobs, come from situations just like that because you've overcome them. You've overcome an obstacle. You've struggled with an addiction, and you're free now. They, they become your testimony. The test becomes the testimony. They become the greatest tool to open new doors for you, keys to open new doors. The battle that Goliath was expecting had suddenly changed shape. David knew that power could come in other forms. David went out there in that field, in that valley, knowing that he would take down Goliath. You never see him wavering. Saul wavered. His brothers wavered. The Israelites wavered. There were probably other people that wavered. But David never wavered. He knew that the skill he developed would take down that giant. The status quo in the world often overlooks the individual that would be considered the least of these. Does that remind you of some scriptures? God use, uses the least of these. The least of the things that are in our hands to accomplish great things. There's a passage in 1 Corinthians 1, 26 and 27. I want to read this to you. For you see your calling, brethren, that there are not many wise according to the flesh. Not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. In the base things of the world, in the things which are despised, God has chosen. Paul says to get his job done, God uses things that are foolish, things that are weak, things that are base, and things that are despised. This is the way God works. Why does he work that way? So God gets the glory. So we can say, my God is faithful. I can assure you that the seed for your victory is already in your hand. It's probably a skill that you've already learned, a lesson that you've already learned, at least the seed of it. Maybe it's more than that but it is already in your hand. So many of our, us are waiting, God, if you can just do this thing in me, then I can do this. Lord, if I have that gift, or, or I have this money, or you do this for me, or, or give me a wife, or give me a husband, if you do this, then I can be this. That is not how God works. At least in my experience and what I read in Scripture, the people that I talk to, that is not typically how God works. The seed for your victory, the seed for your next miracle is already in your hand. Can you say that? The seed for my next miracle is already in my hand. I believe that for you. I believe that for me. I'm a testimony of that. My life is a testimony of that. So God uses the foolish things. You know who D.L. Moody is? Well, you know of D.L. Moody because he started Moody radio stations and the Bible Institute. But do you realize that he was an uneducated man? He started all those things, didn't go to college. He was uncultured. He was uneducated. History is full of people like that. Do you know, this is, this is interesting. Do you know that a third of all successful entrepreneurs are actually dyslexic. A third. That's like a huge number. A third of all successful entrepreneurs. I, when I heard that, I'm like, I don't believe it. I'm going to go check it out. And I got some names. It's 
This said that there's an extra nor, extraordinary high number of successful entrepreneurs who are dyslexic, like a third of them. Richard Branson, the billionaire entrepreneur, dyslexic. Charles Schwab, dyslexic. David Nealman, the founder of JetBlue, dyslexic. John Chambers, the CEO of Cisco. Paul Ofello, the founder of Kinkles. All these people are dyslexic. There's like a whole list of them. I just brought out the ones that you would know. A third of all successful entrepreneurs, dyslexic. I don't know if any of you have ever struggled from dyslexia, but maybe I just gave you a different perspective. Maybe that learning disability that you have can be the thing that actually creates success in your life. Have you ever been around an individual who can't see? They can hear like 10 times better than you can. Matter of fact, they can probably warn you of danger before you can see danger. When you have a disability or you have a weakness, there's something else that you've developed, a skill that you've developed, a way to survive that you've developed that, that's accelerated more so than anybody else because you've had to develop that thing to survive. I think dyslexic, dyslexic folks evidently are like that. They have to discover a different way to learn and a different way to succeed. Your disability or perceived weakness can give you an edge. You believe that? I believe that. One of my favorite playwrights, I quote him often in, different, um, in some of my different messages, but George Bernard Shaw said, said this, the reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. You know, I think it's all right to be a little bit unreasonable not accepting the status quo. I'm not talking about being rude and being forceful and manipulating. I'm talking about we don't have to just stand and let life run over us. When we think about expanding the kingdom and going out and changing, changing culture and changing things, you're going to have to be a little bit unreasonable. You can be loving, but still be a little bit unreasonable. People have studied these dyslexic and they've coined a term. Most of these dyslexics that succeed are a little bit disagreeable. They just don't accept things. They will not accept failure. Just because I am this way, it doesn't mean that I can't succeed. And it actually inspires them and drives them to succeed. I came up with a miracle-making equation for us as we think about this season of walking through doors that God opens for us. I'm going to call it the kingdom expansion equation. Faith plus surrender, surrendering what is in our hand, the gift that we have, the knowledge that we have, the revelation that we already have, equals your next miracle or victory squared. And the reason why I say squared, because your victory is not just for you. Your victory is for the other people in your life and the other people that you impact. Faith plus surrender, and surrendering what is already in your hand equals your next miracle. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up while I finish this. What's faith? It's trusting in a God who is trustworthy. That's what faith is. It's not blind. We have a relationship with God. We know that he's faithful. So our faith is not blind. It's trusting in a God who is trustworthy, and this is what you trust that all things work together for good. For who? For those who love God and are called to his purposes. That's not for everybody. That's for us. There is success out in the world, but we, de we define a different sort of success. God is able to take incredible weakness, the flaws in our life, the mistakes that we've made, and make them into something beautiful. Because all things work together for good. What's surrender? We have to surrender everything that we are and everything that we have. All our gifts, all our talents, we have to say, God, use them. Use me. So instead of spending your time coveting what other people have, wishing you could be the worship leader, or wishing that you could be a better speaker, or wishing that you got the promotion and not that other person got the promote because 
because that's actually the enemy. There's actually another formula. It's the death equation. Fear, which is the enemy of faith. Withholding, which is the enemy of surrender. If you're the type of individual that is always looking for something more, never satisfied with what they have, there's a good side to that and there's a bad side to that. The bad side is some people just are never satisfied with what God has given them. And they overlook and take for granted what they have. God wants you to be satisfied with the lot that you've been given. To me, in my mind, that's what being rich is. Can you be content in what you have now? Because evidently God thinks that's enough for now. And I think that until we begin to see what he's already put in our hands, he's not very interested in putting any more in your hand. I believe that. That's a word for this congregation. It's a word for me in this season. The seed to your next victory is already in your hand. You believe that? Can you stand up with me? I'm going to pray over you, and I want you to ask this question. God, what have you already put in my hand? What have you already given me that is the key to that open door? Because it's already there. Now you're praying for things. And God has answers for those things. You know, maybe you do need a new job. But maybe you don't get that new job until you become satisfied with the job that you have. And serve the boss that you have. And pray for him. Maybe maybe God's going to keep you there. Until you learn that thing that he wants to teach you. God knows where you're at. He knows who you are. He knows what you need before you ask it. And if you're so concerned about the future, Pastor Ron C. talked about this. Not living in the moment, you overlook those keys. And God wants you to move through those doors. But I think that we will not be able to move through those doors until we ask those questions. God, what have you already put in my hand to create success? to bless people, to prosper me and prosper others around me. So that's what I pray. Lord, I thank you, Father, that you actually give us an unfair advantage, your sons and your daughters. We have an unfair advantage because we have a God that sees all things, that is not bound by time, that lives already in the future where we're going. You see it all. And Lord, your desire for us, your sons and your daughters, is to create success. For us to walk in abundant living. In a lot of, and that abundant living can exist in the midst of confusion, in chaos, in trials, in, in poverty. If we're willing to fix our eyes on you, if we're willing to look at those things in a different way. So Lord, I pray that you would give us a new perspective. You never allow us to go through anything that we cannot bear. It says you never allow a temptation to come into our life, never allow a trial to come into our life, never allow a a giant or obstacle to come in our life that you don't provide a way out. And the reason why you allow those things is because those things refine us. And those things also say, I can't trust myself. I can't just trust the abilities that I have. I have to trust the God that knows all things and has my back. So Lord, help us to go to you and ask you What is already in my hand? What seed have you already planted in my life? What revelation have you given me? What skill, what talent, what gift, what resource, what relationship have you already given me that's going to create success in my life? And help me to build on that so that we are equipped to walk through that door that you've opened for us. I pray that. 
for this congregation. I pray that for your children. I pray that over my life. I pray that over my family, over my children. They would, they would ask that question. What have you already put in my hand that will create success in that abundant life that you so desire us to live in? And we just thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. That Amen. little bit that he has placed in your hand. That little bit of God that you already know is the seed for who you're going to become if you'll trust in him. Grow in him. You have everything you need. See, that's the key. This David thing, Goliath, you think you're so big. You remember Goliath said, who do you think I am? A dog? You come to me with spears and sticks. And David looked at Goliath and said, who do you think you are? Let me tell you who my God is, whom you have defied. God in you is all you need. You can feel free to worship on your way out of here. We'll have the altar ministry team up here if you want for prayer. If something just sparked in you and you just need an extra dose of encouragement, you need somebody to pray over you, please, we welcome you to come up to the altar. And for all the rest of you, God bless you. Remember, keep asking that question because the Lord will show you. He'll answer you. Amen. God